stand in body or spirit as we join together for our call to worship. Actually, before we do that, I believe there's something we didn't do last Sunday, and since it's still Eastertide, let me proclaim, He is risen. He is risen indeed. All right. Now, our call to worship. According to God's deliberate plan, according to the foreknowledge of God, Jesus of Nazareth was handed over to us. We crucified him by our hands. As all his persons can kill him. But God raised him up, having freed him from death. For it was not possible for him to be held by the power of death. God has made known to us the way of life. God has filled us in gladness with the presence of Jesus Christ. Let's sing hymn number 114. to condemn only Christ and Christ died for us Christ rose for us Christ reigns in power for us Christ prays for us anyone who is in Christ is a new creation the old has gone and a new life has begun my Christian friends in the person of Jesus Christ we stand justified we stand sanctified and our sins are forgiven
Good morning. How are you all doing today? I'm glad to hear that I am. And this, today, I thought we might talk about encouragement. Oh, right? I don't encourage. Oh, you do? Well, that was my first question. Is that when you do know? Oh, and Aribia, I don't well, know. let's let Aribia tell us. Aribia, what does it mean to encourage someone?
Let us pray. Draw us close, Holy Spirit, as the scriptures are read and the word is proclaimed. Let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts, and let all other words slip away. May there be one voice we hear today, the voice of truth and grace. Amen. We have two scripture readings for this morning. The secondary lection is from the Gospel of John. You can find it on page 1687 of most of your pew Bibles. Um, prior to this reading, Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, and Jesus also appeared to his disciples. Here we pick up in John chapter 20, verses 24 through 31. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Now, if we skip ahead about 200 pages to page 1886, we will now have our primary lection, which is from 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This ends the scripture reading for this morning. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I will say that uh, the, the letter, the first letter of Peter uh, to the church is um, uh, considered by most scholars to be a very late writing. Um, in fact, perhaps uh, uh, one of the uh, last few letters uh, to make their way into the New Testament. It's uh, written at a time when, when Christians have been Christians long enough to have to suffer the consequences for their faith. They are already uh, facing persecution, which is what precipitates uh, the author of 1 Peter to be telling his audience that they are suffering for their faith in Christ. And he wants to make clear that 
as much as suffering is one of those types of things we try to avoid, suffering is an inevitable part of having faith in Jesus Christ, he, he so says. It, it, it warrants some consideration because uh, suffering is not uh, an alien or a stranger to us all in, in this world here in the 21st century. Maybe, it's hard to say, I, don't, I can't speak for each and every one of you, but it, uh, it may be that you're probably not suffering the persecutions for your faith that the first century Christians were. <coughs> but I dare say that you probably know some suffering in your life or have um, and, and still will as time goes on. It just seems to be the inevitable course of human existence. So we have to ask ourselves the question in reading this passage, how do we understand suffering? It's, it's the, the age-old question. In fact, it, it was uh, the title of, um, of a book that was very popular back in the 1980s, I believe, Why Do Good Things... Uh, why, excuse me, Why Do Bad Things... Gotta make sure I get the title right. Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? I believe that was the title of the book. I see a few heads nodding, but I think, I think that's it. So, and, you know, it's, uh, it's an existential question. And I'm not certain that we've ever arrived at a, an answer that satisfies us, but I'll tell you why it doesn't satisfy us. We simply don't like suffering. Uh, that shouldn't come as a surprise. It's suffering. <laughs> Who likes that, right? Um, let me see. Would you rather have an ice cream cone or a uh, poke in the eye with a sharp stick? Um, <laughs> it's not a hard choice, I would imagine, my Christian friends. How do we understand suffering? Commentators of 1 Peter have um, come up with quite diverse ways of looking at it. Is suffering, we have, let's just ask some of the questions. Is suffering part of God's divine plan for believers and for human history as a whole? Is it part of the divine plan? <coughs> Almost as though we're predestined to suffer. Or is it a happenstance whose origins we can't really explain? Just, you know... Suffering happens. Does God send tests through suffering in order to refine us? Or is it rather when the suffering comes along as a happenstance that God just happens to use it at the appropriate time to strengthen us in our faith? Uh, those, those, those are four different types of questions we could ask about the nature of suffering, and I'm not certain I have the answer for you on this front. All I know is that suffering is a reality. You know it, and I do too. Whether it is um, the purpose of suffering, whether the purpose of suffering and whatever its outcome is, um, what First Peter is trying to get us to consider uh, is uh, he's insisting that for Christians, trial can purge and refine and purify our faith. That's where he's going with this. It's in effect, he's basically saying that whether we like suffering or not, and I dare say we don't, suffer, there, we are called as Christians to redeem suffering, turn it into little resurrections, help it, use it to strengthen our faith and our resolve in Jesus Christ. Redeem the suffering. That's what we're called to do. Not to eliminate it. Not to pretend like it doesn't exist. But to redeem it. As Christ redeems us. Of course the trials that uh, First Peter has in mind result from people making confessions in Jesus Christ. But Christians in our own time might be able to generalize the point to understand our own sufferings. What most Christians have observed is that the same trials and struggles that some believers go through will strengthen some and destroy others. The faith that, that Christians have is, is it's, it's a very fickle thing in some respects. Some Christians will encounter suffering and their faith will be strengthened through it. Others will encounter the suffering and it will destroy their faith. Make them jaundiced toward Jesus Christ and their relationship with God. And there's no predicting. Some of the most faithful people you might know might encounter some suffering in their lives which will hurl them into some state 
where they are simply indifferent to the love of God. While others who seem marginal in their faith might suddenly become spiritual giants because of the suffering that they have endured. There's no predicting. Persecution can establish faith or it can destroy it. And in our day, even more mundane matters like a debilitating illness can lead some to God or it can drive them away. There's no predicting. You know, I think suffering is often seen, my Christian friends, as the enemy of faith. But faith and suffering, I submit to you, as is the case with the author of 1 Peter, suffering and faith are two sides of the same coin when you stop and think about it. And this is what makes it possible for us to redeem the suffering when we go through it. Faith is not a matter of emotion. It's not a matter of intellect. Faith is not that. Faith is will. It's choice. It's volition. Faith is a matter of will. We choose to have faith. We choose to have faith, my Christian friends. Suffering makes room for faith, as 1 Peter is saying. Contentment, ecstasy, fortune, comfort, they actually push faith aside. That sounds counterintuitive, but it's true. These things are expressions of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, self-control. And because of that, when we start believing in our own self-sufficiency, when we start depending on our own self-reliance, we have very little room for faith in our lives. We don't need faith because we can do it ourselves. Suffering reminds us that we are not in control. Thinking that we're going through life in control self-reliant, self-sufficient, is an illusion that we tell ourselves to make ourselves comfortable because we are afraid of being out of control. We are afraid of suffering. We are afraid of the pain that the trials bring. The simple truth is none of us is exempt, not one. Faith and suffering go hand in hand because Suffering reminds us, I can't save myself. I need something beyond me for help. I may need others. I may need God. But I can't do it myself. I can't get through this world by myself. It is too painful. It requires me either to give up on humanity, give up on God, or to move in the direction of saying I'm utterly, totally in the hands of others. I am totally in the hands of God. It's an act of faith, not emotion, not intellect, it's will. I choose to have faith in the midst of the sufferings that I endure in my life. We often lull ourselves, by the way, in, in thinking, uh, sort of like uh, Doubting Thomas, by, uh, that we uh, had, uh, that Philip read for us, uh, that uh, Philip read in our uh, secondary reading. Uh, we, uh, uh, by the way, I, uh, you've heard me say this before, but I'm going to say it again. Uh, we need to get rid of that moniker uh, for Thomas, calling him Doubting Thomas. Uh, he's not doubting, uh, or he, well, no more so than the other disciples were, let's be fair. All right. His only sin was that he was late for the meeting. That's it. The other disciples got to... I mean, think about the story. Look at the story in John, in John chapter uh, 20. Mary Magdalene sees the risen Jesus. What does she do? She comes back and she tells the disciples, the 11 who were there, Thomas is absent. And what do they say? They don't believe her. They don't believe her. 
Then Jesus appears to them, and they have the benefit of Jesus presenting himself to them so that they can believe that they might have faith. Thomas, he's not doing anything different than the other disciples. When, when those eleven say to it, excuse me, the ten, I'm sorry, Judas is out of the scene. When the ten step up, then suddenly they tell him, we've seen the risen Lord. Judas is going to say, absolutely not, I do not believe that. And he sets conditions. I've got to touch him. I've got to experience the risen Lord myself before I will believe. And of course, Jesus accommodates. Because he recognizes that whatever the grounds of his faith are, those are less important than his faith alone. Jesus provides Thomas what he needs for faith. It's grace. It's a gift. Despite all the movies that you and I have seen about Jesus and the disciples, we tend to... Um, uh, romanticize this idea that, oh, what if, if I could only have walked with Jesus, I would have had far greater faith than I have today. If I could have just walked with Jesus like the original disciples, you know, bring it into real technicolor, right? Um, just get out there in the world with Jesus in his day. If I could have walked with him, I would have believed. I wouldn't have had doubt. It's false romanticism, my Christian friends, to think that our commitment would have been improved if we were there to experience that ministry firsthand. In a manner of speaking, it we are experiencing it. We are experiencing it firsthand when we read the stories, which is exactly what uh, the, the the reading, the secondary reading, ends with. When John steps out of the narrative and begins to say, "All these things are written down so that you can believe." That's why these pages are written for generations later who do not have this so-called romantic vision of walking with Jesus. We have also what we need for faith. Then and now, it is finally by faith that we lay hold of the promises, not by being with Jesus back 2,000 years ago, but by being with Christ and his spirit today. And by will, we simply have faith in his promises. That no matter whether the times are good or the times are filled with trial and suffering, God is with us. And God's brothers and sisters, you and me, are with us. We are not alone. Yes, we have been disappointed by our fellow human beings. We've been disappointed by our fellow Christians. We have been even by our feelings sometimes disappointed in God himself. And by the way, there's no sin in admitting that. It's okay to be upset with God. If, uh, I mean, people get upset with God. Even faithful people get upset with God. I promise you, God is big enough. He can take it. You want to be angry with God? It's okay. It's okay. My Christian friends, the entire lesson both the, the gospel lesson and the epistle lesson today can be summed up in a paraphrase in the third verse of a very popular hymn. Hear whether we can discern that word. Listen. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis faith has brought me safe thus far. Faith will lead me home. Amen, and may God bless this witness to the glory of his name.
having heard how God has called us to faith in the proclamation of the word, let us now reaffirm our faith on this occasion, as is tradition for us on Sundays when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Let us reaffirm our faith with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. to the needs assessment that we've been talking about the past few Sundays. Uh, David Jeff of our session uh, of the worship committee uh, has a word for us today. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the committee that is, put the, that is putting this together for all of us. It's been a long, long time since we've done this. I don't know how many years, but I do remember when it was done, quite some time ago. And I think it's time to do it again because we've been through a lot, as we all know. Most recently, the COVID and how it has changed us and our congregation. The community has grown. Madison County has grown. Richmond has grown. Let's participate in that as we can. Let us look at ourselves, look at our strengths, look at our weaknesses, and put a future together for us that we can follow and be determined of our own future. So thank you, committee, for what you've done, and let's all participate in this. Let us all get involved. Let us determine our direction for the future. Thank you. David, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's encouraging when uh, we also have uh, uh, the uh, Education Committee, which is uh, 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 driving our uh, needs assessment, but the session is trying to be on board with this as well, and we're reaching out to the congregation with hopes that, that you will uh, be willing to uh, participate on uh, Sunday, the uh, 21st of May. I want to make sure I get the date right. Uh, and uh, so that'll be a time uh, after church. I think lunch is provided. And then uh, a time with, uh, I think it's uh, Peggy Hines uh, from uh, a, a Presbytery consultant who will come in and uh, help us work through uh, our needs assessment. So uh, David, thank you very much. Um, 
And uh, so mark that date on your calendar, by the way. Um, and uh, if I may, I would like to invite the congregation to join me in prayer. Gracious God, we know that there have been times of trial, times of suffering, trial, times of testing in our lives. You have been a gracious God, even though sometimes we don't always feel your presence. Sometimes we feel so tested that we want to walk away from you and from others. Still, we choose to have faith. We trust that your loving kindness abides in us and in each other. In the midst of our down times, in the midst of our sufferings, may we be able to find hope in you and in one another as your faithful people. Help us to see the loving and gracious and compassionate presence of Jesus Christ in the faces of all who are around us. And may we ourselves be the hope of redemption to the sufferings of others. Strengthen us so by your spirit that we may be Christ for one another. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. <coughs> he who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this point in our service of worship, we continue worship by, <coughs> by recognizing that just as God has given of himself for us by his love and compassion, we too, by love and compassion, give of ourselves for God. Uh, let, that be a time, uh, let there be a time of our uh, self-reflection in our giving uh, through the uh, meditations of the offertory.
Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who through his own suffering redeemed us. He redeemed the world. He redeemed suffering so that it is no longer an enemy to us, but something through which our faith can be strengthened. Strengthen us this day as we participate in this sacrament, as we participate in our own self-giving. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. My Christian friends, we're such a busy church, it's just amazing to watch as we're, we're trying to uh, live stream and do communion at the same time. Everyone is just in here. Everyone's getting close and personal, aren't they? So, um, uh, I want everyone to remember that this is the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. People will be coming from east and west. They come from north and south to be a part of the covenant established for us in the life and death and resurrection of Christ, which is what this meal represents. It represents the very sacrifice of Christ. It represents his death and resurrection. It is a sign that we participate in that great covenant that Christ has made for us. That, that, that great hope that he has given us of new life toward God and toward one another. All who have contrite hearts, all who know Christ, are welcome at this table. It is not a Presbyterian table. It is the Lord's table. All are invited. As has been for 2,000 years, so it is today, we are invited once again to come and participate in what Christ has established for us. I invite you today, my Christian friends, come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Let us pray. O holy God, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, with joy we give you thanks and praise. By your own power, you raised Jesus Christ from the dead to life. Through his victory over the grave, we are set free from the bonds of sin and from the fear of death to share in the glorious freedom of the children of God. In his rising to life, you promised eternal life to all who believed in him. We praise you that as we break bread in faith, we shall know the risen Christ among us. How wonderful are your ways, Almighty God! How marvelous is your name! You alone are God, and therefore with apostles and prophets and that great cloud of witnesses who live for you beyond all time and space, we lift our hearts in joyful praise. We praise you, most holy God, for sending your only Son, Jesus Christ, to live among us full of grace and truth. He made you known to all who received him. Sharing our joy and sorrow, he healed the sick and was a friend of sinners. Obeying you, he took up his cross and died that we might live. We praise you that he has overcome death and has risen to rule the world and that he remains a friend of sinners. We trust him to overcome every power that can hurt or divide us, and we believe that when he comes in glory, we will celebrate victory with him. Therefore, in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we take this bread and this cup and give you praise and thanksgiving. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that this bread and this cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord, and that we and all who share this feast may be one with Christ as he is one with us. Fill us with eternal life, that with joy we may be his faithful people until we feast with him in glory. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, and in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Those who believe in me shall never hunger, and those who follow shall never thirst. After the disciples had eaten, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood. Drink, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we do proclaim the Lord's death until he returns.
Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Once again, let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, we are grateful that you have allowed us to see in the ordinary of bread and wine the extraordinary of your son's sacrifice, of his death and resurrection, of his ministry and his love. Empower us by these simple elements to be bold enough to be the body of Christ for the world, that we may go forth as your own form of incarnation through us, an incarnation of your love and grace, your hope and mercy, your justice, all for the world. May we be that, all because of the merits of your Son. It is in Christ's most holy name that we pray. Amen. Christian friends, to go in peace, and may the God of peace, who brought from the dead our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip us for all good gifts, that we may be about the work of God, now and forever. Amen.